joining us for the second um, in the series of Meet the Speakers, uh, which the Speakers Agency is delighted to be uh, holding today. Um, some of you will have been with us last week. To the newcomers, we've been going since 2001 and we supply speakers and moderators and presenters and facilitators to conferences and all sorts of other events around the UK, Europe and the rest of the world. Um, we're, we're an agency that deals with clients big and small, global conglomerates right through to educational establishments and private individuals. We, um, we like putting on these showcases because we're entering a virtual world for the time being, as you all know, and because live events are being replaced by online events and our speakers are all prepared for this and have been for some time, that means that we can go ahead with things like this to showcase their fabulous talents. And um, before I introduce everybody, I just wanted to say that um, today's theme of kindness and confidence got me thinking that we've all taken a bit of a battering. And I was talking to various friends last night and they were saying things, um, and, and it all goes with mental health really, doesn't it? Because um, from vanity things like, can you see my roots when I'm talking on camera? Do I look okay? Right through to friends who've lost jobs and um, will I ever find another job? Will I be able to pay my bills? Why have I been furloughed when somebody else hasn't? And will I be able to cope with the new normal that seems to be ahead of us? And I think it the list's endless from the very smallest to the biggest concerns. And today we've got four really fabulous speakers again, who will be giving you a few tips on confidence and kindness and also um, just to showcase their fabulous talents. We've got the former press secretary to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, Dickie Arbiter, who is on first. And then we're going to be speaking to Dudley Stokes, who's the famous, uh, the man that captained the famous Jamaican bobsleigh team. And um, he's a four-time Olympian. And uh, you'll all know Cool Runnings. And then we've got Katie King, who was with us last week, who hosts this, and the wonderful TV presenter and broadcaster, Nikki Chapman, to finish it off before we go to Q&A. Anyway, I'm going to pass you over to Katie, and I'll just finish it up at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Welcome to you all. Uh, greetings. I'm um, down here in Kent in Tunbridge Wells um, with a husband and a couple of children and a dog. So I hope they don't come into the background. They've been told to keep away, but you never know. Um, so we've got the next hour, as Sylvia says, to cover a really, really important topic. I've got people in my family who suffered from bipolar and anxiety. I heard the tragic news of, you know, a young lad at 17. You know, my husband's an A-level teacher and this poor young lad's, you know, taken his life because he's worried about his A-level results in, in COVID not being able to study. I think these are really, really difficult times for everybody. So you're, you're already hopefully seeing from us that this is about, you know, honesty, there's a lot of integrity, there's, um, you know, really sharing with you in a very empathetic and honest way, our views, our stories. So I'll be doing that as well. Um, but I've got the pleasure of introducing the, the, the other three speakers. But first off, a bit about the agenda. As I say, we've got an hour. So I will introduce Dickie in a moment. After each of the four speakers have presented for no more than 10 minutes each, it's a flavor of what you can expect from us if you book us as speakers. Speakers not only for your face-to-face -face events, dinners, etc., but also virtually. What we're doing here is we're showcasing through a simple platform and a free platform I happen to use the paid for one, but simply because I want bigger numbers. But this is a, a free platform, Zoom, which you can use for your own virtual conferences. And on recent events like this, we've had a lot of people saying, I've all of a sudden been tasked with run a, running a virtual event in five weeks time. You know, how do I get virtual speakers? We're there. So you can book us for virtual events as well as the typical face-to-face -face events that we do. So you'll hear from each of us for seven to 10 minutes, and then we'll have an opportunity to go into two breakout rooms. We'll have 10 minutes in the first breakout room, and myself and Nikki will be in one, and Dickie and uh, Dudley and Sylvia will be, be in the other, and then we will switch, and us two speakers will go into the other meeting room. So you as the, the guests will get the opportunity to ask us questions, but also we'll get a chance to know you a little bit, and maybe speak to you about some of the challenges you face at the moment. Then we'll rejoin, 
the bigger group and have a final Q&A and then a final wrap up from Sylvia. So that's the agenda. It's only about an hour or so. You'll have an opportunity at the end to carry on any last minute conversations. We are recording the speak, speaker sessions. We won't be recording the breakouts, but we will be taking just a few screenshots when we're in the breakout room. So if you aren't keen on that, just switch off your webcam at that moment. Um, but other than that, we're, we're all good to go. And um, I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker. He's best known, as Sylvia said, um, for, out of all really, all of Her Majesty the Queen's former press secretaries. He's Dickie Arbiter. He's the man that the press call when the royals are in the news, whether that's weddings, deaths, births, celebrations, scandals, um, and general interest stories. So Dickie's an exceptionally talented speaker with over 50 years of experience covering royalty, heads of state, and other globally recognized personalities. He's also a journalist, a broadcaster, and he's spent all of these years you know, covering these outstanding areas. So great person if you want to book him for speaking, lecturing, media training as well. So uh, I am going to hand over now to Dickie. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Katie, and hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Kindness and confidence, interesting subject uh, dreamed up by Sylvia, um, and you've got to think about what is confidence. Confidence is all about uh, a belief in oneself, belief in one's own ability, belief in that you can do something and nothing is actually going to stand in your way. Does it go hand in hand with kindness? Well, it can, uh, but sometimes confidence overshadows kindness which means that kindness really does stand on its own. It is about being nice to people, being complimentary to people, being available to people, uh, not doing them down, not gossiping about them, just generally be, being nice. Um, but there is a danger with confidence, and this is, comes about with body language. Body language can really overinflate the confidence, can create arrogance. Uh, can create uh, a self-importance, which uh, really is not what about confidence is all, all about. It's really uh, plugging a deficiency in, in the individual. From my own standpoint, where, where do I come from? Well, I was brought up during the war, and I suppose confidence came to me at a very early stage. Bombs were falling, air raid signs were going off, but in between, uh, we went about our normal business. I went to school, bombs permitting. Uh, but it was after the war when I went to prep school, age, age six, uh, that I was thrown, by the time I got to seven, into the school pantomime. Uh, and here I was on stage. I thought, wow, I do like this. And this sort of um, set me on a path of what I wanted to do later. And I never really changed my mind. Uh, and I did become an actor. And I did become a stage manager. And I drifted into broadcasting. And I suppose being on the stage at a tender age of seven and coming from a broken home, firstly being brought up by, by a single dad, and when my dad died, then by my mother, I learned a lot of independence. And when you're independent, you become confident. Uh, and, I, and I think both of them go hand in hand. Unfortunately, sometimes confidence overshadows kindness, which is, which is a great pity. But we have seen a lot uh, over these past few weeks with this current pandemic, uh, kindness excelling itself uh, all over, whether it's in hospitals, whether it's in open ground, whether you're walking and people are avoiding you, people are actually kind in trying to avoid and trying to keep that social distance. So what about the royal family, which, which this is where I come from, um, because for over 50 years I reported on the royal family, I worked for the royal family, and now I comment on the royal family. And one particular person stands out, I'll talk about the Queen in a moment, but one particular person stands out who lacked a lot of confidence when he was a little boy, that's Prince Charles. He was teased and bullied when he went to Cheam. He was teased and bullied at Hill House, and he was bullied uh, when he went to Gordonston, and he hated Gordonston. He made no secret of that. And he came out and he blossomed when he spent a term at Geelong in Australia. This was the sort of rough and ready and something that he really liked. He was accepted as a person as he was, not for what he was going to become. And as he got older, he developed, he developed in confidence. He went into the services, he went, because he, one day he'll be commander in chief. So he uh, went into the air force and he learned to fly fixed wing airplanes and helicopters. He, um, he commanded a, a minesweeper and he jumped out of airplanes. And this was his development. This was his, his, his uh, 
confidence building. So much so that when he came out of the Navy after, after his commission, his payoff money he threw into developing an organization called the Prince's Trust, which today is highly successful, helping young disadvantaged young people. Uh, and it was one of those ideas that he had that young people needed to be helped. And it was quite interesting that it took off. And today, here we are in the 21st century, that it receives funds in excess of 100 million pounds a year. It helps youngsters get on the first rung of the employment ladder, get into housing, uh, young entrepreneurs who can't get a loan from banks, they will be given a soft loan by the Prince's Trust. And about 90% of these young entrepreneurs are successful. So much so, they plow money back into the Prince's Trust. And they are the ones, they're taught confidence. Uh, and because they've had this step up on the, on the ladder, whether it's accommodation, employment, or entrepreneurship, they've gained and, and learned confidence. As somebody else who, who, who uh, learned confidence at a young age, uh, because she had to, is the Queen. Basically, she was a shy person uh, and a reserved person. But because being thrown into what she does now, 68 years on the throne, age 94, she's developed over the years. She came to the throne in 1952, age 26, and she's grown into it. People marvel at how she does the job today, still does the job today. People would sort of wonder, um, why is it the press lampooned her when she's teased about saying to people, where do you come from? How long have you been waiting? It's her way of melting, of, of breaking down the barriers. I've seen time and time again, receptions at Buckingham Palace, the Queen doing the rounds, walking into groups. For example, a few years ago, it was a Queen's Award to Industry reception. Captains of industry used to, uh, signing big multi-billion pound contracts. But Queen walks into the group and what do they do? To a man, they curtsy. it. She'd seen it many times and it, she didn't react to it. But it just gives an indication of the sort of aura that surrounds this woman. And what about her television appearances? She first appeared on television uh, in her Christmas message it was 1957. It was live. She's not a performer, she's not a television artist, but there she sat in a chair at Sandringham House where her grandfather first did his Christmas message in 1932, delivering a message. She had notes on the table, she didn't need them, but she had notes on the table because that's how she delivered her Christmas messages on radio with notes. But she delivered that message and more recently, well, not so much more recently, in 1997, she de delivered uh, her tribute to the late Diana Princess of Wales. Again, that was a live broadcast. She's not used to it. She's used to recording. And she's, she's renowned for being a one-take recorder uh, because she does her, her Christmas message. She looks at the teleprompter. She does it. She only does it again if she's not happy with it, not if the production staff are not happy with it. But if they are not happy with it, it's invariably because there's been some out, outside noise. And then more recently, that, there was that terrific, heart-rending message, uh, the coronavirus message. We all remember, what did she say? We'll see our friends again. We'll meet our families again. We will meet again. And then only last Friday, her BE Day message. She is a focal point for when things go wrong in the United Kingdom. She is stability. She's continuity. And people do turn to her. And what about the rest of the royal family? They've learned confidence over the years. There are those who will say Prince Andrew is arrogant. Yes, perhaps he is. He came across arrogant in that BBC television interview last November. Uh, and we won't go into that. The youngsters, uh, Prince William, he learned confidence in the army. He, he uh, brought up in a broken home. But he developed. He developed in the army, as did Prince Harry. Prince Harry, for him, the army was the best thing. Leaving the army left Harry absolutely rudderless. He really doesn't know where to go. He is now in America with his wife, Meghan. And are they getting off the ground with their, uh, with their charitable foundation? Well, we still have to wait and see. Overall, I think the royal family do show confidence. We saw only a couple of days ago, the 200th anniversary of the, uh, the birth of Florence Nightingale, the International Nursing Day, members of the royal family delivering video messages. We had Princess Anne talking to a healthcare worker in Tanzania. We saw the Duchess of, of Cambridge speak. We saw uh, Countess of Wessex speak. Prince of Wales spoke. Uh, Prince William spoke. They're getting used to 
this type of way of communicating. The coronavirus has done a lot, it's done a lot of damage, but it's done a lot to help us communicators communicate with you. And it's very important that we're able to do it because if we didn't have this, we would lose touch with everybody. So that brings us back, back again to confidence and kindness. We're confident that we're able to do this. And if the worst comes to the worst, we can carry on communicating with you because it's important that neither of us lose touch. It kindness, it is important that we show kindness to you because you, after all, are the ones that you will book us in, in, time to in time to come. And we would like to talk to you, whether it is this way, uh, via, uh, via Zoom or Microsoft or Google, whichever way, or Skype, but it is important that we keep in touch. So we will keep confident, you be kind to us and you book us. <laughs> Thank Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dickie. Thank you for a refreshingly honest opinions and views and insights there. Thank you. So next up, we have Dudley, Dudley Tal Stokes, who's, um, as Sylvia mentioned, his Olympic debut was immortalized in the film Cool Runnings, now regarded as an iconic film with a huge fan base. And I certainly remember, and I'm sure lots of you will never forget the saying, feel the rhythm. So um, Dudley is a four-time Olympian. He went from what many regarded as an imposter team to a genuine contender in just six years. He's a popular speaker on both sides of the Atlantic, and he speaks on peak performance, why it matters to people in both their private and their working lives. Um, it's invaluable for companies who want to improve their team performances as well. I myself work with a lot of corporates. And I know how important it is for them. So Dudley's a very successful entrepreneur um, and serial entrepreneur and very successful at that. So an expert in logistics too. And he shares his wealth of knowledge and experience on a variety of subjects. And as we're going to hear now, does so in a very direct and easily understood way. So uh, over to you, Dudley. Thank you. There we go. There you go. Thank you, Katie. Um, a lovely introduction. Thank you all very much. Was it a very good listening to, to Dickie a uh, while ago? Uh, so I'm a four time Olympian, immortalized in, in cool runnings. Uh, but what I like to focus on is the journey after that. So in six years after crashing in Calgary, we were 10th in the world on two runs, 14th overall and ahead of all American teams. And so how did we do that? Well, we did it by pursuing peak performance. And peak performance is a, a very individual thing. Your peak is not comparative with anybody else. It's your own internal thing. It's being able to get into the right frame of mind and execute at your maximum level, regardless of your environment. And key to being able to do that is confidence. And so we had to learn how to build our confidence. And this is what I talk to people about a lot. How do you build your confidence? How do you get it back when things aren't going as easily as they ought to? Things aren't right, but still you have to perform. And there are a number of ways of doing that and techniques which I do go through. But to say that uh, confidence is necessary for kindness. And I say this because it's, it's easy to be kind when it's your job. And it's easy to be kind when it's your profession. But it's not that easy to be kind to a stranger in the street, somebody you know nothing about or you just come across. To display that kind of kindness, you have to have confidence in yourself, in where you are, in your personal situation. And in the future, which is very difficult. Today, everybody has a, a crisis of confidence in the whole society. It's a general thing because there's nobody who really knows where we're going or where this is going to end up. There are very few people who have lived through anything like this and nobody has seen sort of the, the general scale of the COVID-19 crisis. And that's created a confidence of crisis all throughout. And it's going to be up to each individual to find their own confidence so that they can move forward and display their own kindness to people because we do need that now. Now, 
couple of things about confidence that I'd like to say here and I do speak about. A key ingredient for confidence is disciplined ignorance. And that is not allowing yourself to wander in the future towards outcomes over which you have no control. Invariably, when you do that, you start focusing on the worst case scenarios. It is better to have an outcome that you'd like to see, to create that in your mind and to hold that as to where you're going. But you cannot allow your mind to drift to all the various things that could possibly happen to you because that doesn't allow you want to build confidence. So, you know, along the way, we went through an incredible amount of challenges. So I'll tell you, I was born on Grand Turk in the Turks and Caicos and the son of missionaries from Jamaica. And before that, as I reflected on recently crossing the Atlantic on a cruise ship, I actually, my ancestors came out of West Africa and went into the Caribbean in slavery and went through all that journey. Then I was born on Grand Turk. I went back to Jamaica. And from those sorts of beginnings, I was able to move forward to going to the Olympic Games, going four times. I still have the best finish by a non-traditional athlete in the Olympic Games in the bobsleigh competition and going on to business, going on to a family. It's been an incredible journey when you, when you look back. And every step along that way has been, been a fight. So confidence doesn't stay with you forever. And it's very difficult to get back. And part of peak performance is being able to, as I said before, generate the confidence at will, but also recreate it when you have lost it, when you've met a business failure, when you lost a race, or as we've seen now, when everybody's job has gone away and society has changed fundamentally, and we're all trying to figure out which way to go. So confidence doesn't stay with you, and confidence is not always around when you need it, and you need to have the skills, develop the skills to be able to create your own confidence in the moment and use it. And that will allow you to act with the kind of kindness that will actually be meaningful to somebody who is probably lacking in confidence themselves and maybe on the edge of, of something quite dramatic. So we are, well, swiveling. I don't want to use pivoting. I'm told that that's a, a buzzword. But we, we, we're moving what we're doing here now. It's part of us as speakers rebuilding our own confidence, Sylvie rebuilding her bureau knowing that things are going to be different. So we have moved ourselves online, as you can see, we're developing the skills and we're learning to present virtually to you all. Uh, you know, we, we have the message that I hope people would find inspirational. We certainly have the experience as we've lived through the moments and we think that we have something to contribute to you and your businesses, to your people, to the associations that you belong to. And we'd love to do it. So we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Dudley. That was really inspirational. Really appreciate that. Thank you. So I'm up next and I'm just going to share my screen, which is I have. I think I'm the only speaker who's just got one or two uh, slides to share with you today. So once they load, I will uh, tell you my story. Can you all see that? Let me see a few nods. Can you all see my screen and hear me? Okay, great. So hello, everyone. I'm Katie King and I'm 53 and I am on a journey of continuous learning and without that continuous curiosity, my dad and my parents brought me up in that block of flats there in Tottenham on the 11th floor um, of a council estate. And my parents spoke to everybody and were friendly to everybody. It wasn't a show. They were what they were. They're still alive today, 72 and 82. And they taught me really an, an, an innate self-belief and that came not from money, we didn't have any money, but they gave me unconditional love. 
And when I think about, you know, I'm, I'm a wordsmith, I've written a book, I'll come on to that in a moment. When I think about the definition of, of confidence, it's really about a belief in yourself. It's about a, an ability to meet life's challenges. And, and, you know, and that really has to keep changing. So as Dudley just said, we're all speakers, you know, we've got, we've got a great track record, but we're learning all the time. And that's something I did. So I got to about 30 years into my career, um, successful companies, um, did an MBA, keep learning, learning all the time. But then at 50, three years ago, the, the edge that I had, that USP, that unique selling proposition I had, which was being a leader in digital, digitization, digital marketing, everyone else had caught up. And I needed to pivot. I will use that word. I needed to, to go and educate myself and learn and so on. And I spent a year, and it was a tough year. It was a year where we didn't have any money. It was freezing cold. My house was a building site. I was stuck in a makeshift little kitchen. But I just got my head down. I learned. I hustled and got access to top people and wrote a book which is really current. It's just been translated into Chinese, Russian, Vietnamese, and Turkish. And it's, you know, it's hot property. It won't be hot property forever, but it's hot property at the moment. And it's about the impact of artificial intelligence on marketing. So that belief in yourself either comes if you're lucky because somebody who loved you and cared for you and believed in you has helped instill that in you. And as a parent of two daughters in their 20s and, you know, once had anxiety and my sister-in-law's bipolar, you know, I know how important it is to be a mentor to people, to be there when they want to talk and not to judge. And I think confidence comes from that belief that somebody does believe in you. You know, we're all over social media, many of us, and that validation that we get when someone likes our posts, again, builds that confidence, but it's changed all the time so what I'm doing here we're just quickly showing you a flavor I want to help educate you in the same way that I'm educating myself and in my talks which focus on a whole range of topics I help business people and all kinds of organizations and individuals whether they are just starting off in their career or like some of us are 30 50 years into it to keep learning and so technology is something we need to get our heads around. It doesn't mean we have to go and learn um, to code. I don't know how to code, but I wrote a book and I know how to apply technologies like artificial intelligence to business. And I advise clients on that. And what you're seeing here in this innovation figure is all these different new technologies. AI will come and go over the coming years and there'll be always someone new with some new piece of engineering, science, whatever it might be, that'll be out there talking about the next thing. But I've future proof myself for the next five to 10 years because I'm talking to companies and individuals about, you know, being prepared for change. So we've been caught out as a nation and the world has been caught out by not being prepared. As Bill Gates said we should have been, as Barack Obama said we should have been five years ago in preparing for pandemics. They believe there will be more pandemics in the future. There will certainly be technological change. We'll get used to Zoom year or so down the line, new technologies will come along. So I talk to people about, you know, a bit like Dudley, it's gearing up for change, peak performance, and how you can use technology to actually help you do that. All of the books, all the case studies in my book from some of the world's best academics, best business people, and hundreds of startups brought me to this conclusion. And I talk to companies and individuals about my scorecard for success. And I'll just pick off a couple of bits from this. So not just AI, but when you're gearing up to any kind of change, you need that mindset. It's important for your confidence. It's important really for you to have agility and to keep fresh and to not put yourself in a comfort zone, but to put yourself out of that. And when you are in touch and when you are fresh and tuned in to the latest ways of doing things, and it may be just by being on a Zoom like this and going into a breakout room shortly, that all of a sudden you feel confident in having meetings like this, that's all it takes. But with some, a technology like AI, you need the buy-in from the board. You need number six, 
to understand how are you going to resource this? Do you retrain your people or do you buy in the right kind of resourcing? Number nine is really important. What's the wider impact of all of this change on society? So this brings me on to kindness because, you know, I don't think you should wait until you get to a certain point in your career to then say, okay, I'm going to put my philanthropic hat on now and start doing some good because I've got a little bit of time. My parents instilled that in me from day one and I've always tried, not perfect, but I've always tried to do that and volunteer and be a mentor and try and help other people. And a big percentage of time, some of, you know, some of that work may be voluntary, may be pro bono. So it's looking at the wider impact that technologies like AI have on society. And my goal with a school project I'm just launching, where we're filling in the gap of the current national curriculum, is to help make technology accessible to young people all over the world whatever their race, religion, or economic situation in their country. So that's really important. And that's, to me, also about that kindness. So, you know, as I think, I think it was Dickie that said it first off, you know, not judging, you know, social media, I've been a commentator on BBC for quite a few years about social media and all of the, you know, the challenges and parents ringing into the drive time show I was on with, you know, Dominic King on BBC Radio Kent for a whole year live weekly. And parents worried about the pressures that their young people are under. And, you know, it's just reminding people not to judge not to, you know, especially when we're authentically sitting here in our living rooms, you know, we don't want people kind of criticizing, we shouldn't be doing that ourselves. So I think it's about all of us learning some lessons from the isolation and the amazing work, for example, that the NHS has done to take that into our ongoing learnings as we move back to, you know, a normal way of working. So all of us can be a mentor, all of us can be kind. And I think sometimes just remembering, you know, to speak to people in a nice way, compliment them, support them. It's very easy to criticize. And I think we all need to try to learn to, you know, put ourselves out of our comfort zone and learn to give other people the support that we know we would like to receive. And in so doing, um, I will close and wrap up there. And it's my job now really to introduce the, the final speaker for today. And that's Nikki Chapman, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, a very well-known face presenting programs like BBC's Wanted Down Under and Escape to the Country, which I absolutely love. Um, Nikki is the person that the BBC Radio 2 turns to. She stands in for Zoe Ball on Breakfast Show, Sarah Cox's Drive Time, as well as Vanessa Feltz, Claudia Winkleman, Paul O'Grady and Lisa Tarbuck. So definitely an expert in confidence. Um, Nikki is an experienced speaker and event host and I'm looking forward as I'm sure you are to hearing what she has to say to us. So over to you Nikki, thank you. Thank you very much Katie and also thank you to Nikki and Dudley. It's been fascinating sitting here listening to you talk about confidence and I was feeling pretty confident until I sat through that I was making loads of notes but it goes to show doesn't it that we all are, are confident at some point and then you might actually meet someone or be in a situation where your confidence goes I've actually been really inspired hearing how people deal with it and I think the one thing that the other speakers are having what we all have in common is that we're passionate about what we do we try to be experts in our field and if you can be an expert in your field, whatever it is, that gives you confidence. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. As you heard, I'm a TV and radio presenter. My name's Nikki. Um, I left school, um, like Katie, you know, didn't have perhaps the best beginnings, but I was loved like she was by her family, and that gave you confidence. So I left school at 16, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Now, most TV and radio presenters are pretty sure what they want to do. and They've got the zone, they're in the zone, and they go for it. I was directionless. I went to college, I went traveling, and it was when I was in Australia, and I saw a different way of life from Herne Bay in Kent, where I was brought up, and I came back with confidence. And the reason I found this confidence that I didn't have at 16, leaving school with three O-levels, was I knew what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was to have a different life. I wanted a job that was going to make me happy. I didn't want to work in a little town where I live. There's nothing wrong with that. We all have different goals in life. But Australia gave me a taste of excitement and something different. And because of that, 
it gave me confidence. So here I was, I'm not qualified, I'm not a journalist, didn't go to university, but I got a job in the music industry. And I met people that had oodles of confidence. And if they didn't have oodles of confidence, in the 80s they took things that helped them have oodles of confidence. Now, some of you may know me and some of you don't, but I'm a pretty clean living girl. So everything I had had to come from within. And I didn't have the confidence of these dynamic, zany people, but what I did have was a passion to work hard and to get things right. And that's what I did. I was prepared, I did my homework, I turned up on time every day, I didn't misbehave, I didn't dabble in naughty things. And people started to respect me because if you asked me to do something, I would do it. I'd do it on time and I'd do it to the best of my abilities. And in a way, when you do that, it's those small things, but they give you confidence because someone says, oh, we can rely on Nikki. She'll be there, she'll be on time. She's not gonna do this, she's not gonna do that. She'll do everything that you want. So I had my time in the music industry and I loved it. I was a manager, I was a publicist, and I was looking after some fantastic talent. You know, I am gonna drop a few names, do excuse me, you'll hear the thud in a minute, but I looked after David Bowie, I looked after Eric Clapton, the Spice Girls, Take That, Annie Lennox. And what's really interesting, and you can take, say you take Annie Lennox, one of you know, our most fantastic, talented writers and performers ever, or you take an 18 year old that's leaving school directionless. Both of them have moments in their lives where they're not sure what they want to do, that they lack confidence. And we only think it's us. We don't realize it's everybody else. But I assure you, working with talent, they all go through these periods in their, in their life when they're not sure what they want and they're lacking confidence. And you have to find a mechanism to give it back to them. Often it's surrounding yourself by great people, it's getting rid of the people that are bad influences in your life. And sometimes, you know, that can be quite hard if it's family members. But it's also giving yourself the strength to do what you want to do. And I'll give you a little example. I didn't want to be a presenter, as I said, and I didn't want to be on radio. And it was handed to me on a plate. So if you've got any grandchildren, children, friends that want to be presenters, don't tell them this story because they'll be knocking on doors for years. But I was very fortunate. I did a show called Pop Idol, and from that I was given these fantastic opportunities. And I was asked to present Radio 2. So I'm gonna be doing Radio 2 on Monday morning, and the show that I'm doing on Monday morning is sitting in for Vanessa, and this was the first show they gave me. National show, starts off on about one and a half million listeners, and you finish at 6.30 on six million people listening to you. You don't have anybody else, it's just you in the studio. So Radio 2 asked me to do it. I can't tell you for the three weeks before, I was a mess. My hands were damp, I kept thinking about it. Every time I woke up, it was the first thing I thought of when I went to bed. I had no confidence that I could do this show. And the time is getting closer and closer and it gets to the Sunday night and you know I'm not gonna sleep. I mean, that's guaranteed. So the alarm goes off at 3.30. I get to the studio, I've done all my homework because you know I'm a bit of a squat. Done all my preparation and I'm sitting there and I've got the cans on and I'm looking at the mic and it's saying Radio 2 on it. And as the news is going through, I'm saying to myself, Nikki, the people that run Radio 2 think they can do, I can do it. My producer thinks I can do it. Everybody around me thinks I can do it. They could have picked 50 people who are more qualified than me to sit in and do this radio show. If they think I can do it, why am I the one here that is panicking, having palpitations and can hardly talk because I'm so nervous? And I literally switched. And it was such a great lesson for me because that is now what I do. I talk to myself beforehand. I really get myself in a place where I'm like, okay, I can do this. Because it doesn't matter how much media training you have, how many things you put in place, unless you have that confidence to see you through. When you're nervous, everything falls apart. So it brings me on to Escape to the Country, and Katie beautifully teed it up. Thank you, Katie, because I'm so passionate about this show. And I film it, and remember, this is the girl that didn't want to be a TV presenter or a radio presenter, that I take lovely couples and I show them around houses and we make a TV show. This TV show goes out in 110 countries around the world. And I have seconds, seconds to introduce myself, make them feel comfortable and put them on camera. And they know that all their friends are gonna be watching everything. And it's really important as a presenter, and I use that as a small P, not as a big P, because they're the stars of the show with the, with the properties. 
but it's really important that I can get their confidence straight away, that I can help them, that I am there with them. So as soon as that camera rolls, we're in it together. It's the three of us. And if you watch any of my shows, you will see, and I, well, I hope it's obvious, but I really do genuinely try and connect with them as quickly as I can. I don't have much time with them beforehand off camera. And it's so important that they feel at ease because if they feel at ease, they're going to do a great job and we're going to have a far better program. And that's one of the parts of my job that I absolutely love. I'm a piece of people person. I'm a communicator and I want people to feel confident. I think that is really, really important. Um, uh, just a very small example of losing confidence. Last year, I was very poorly. I had to have major surgery. I have a brain tumor. I still have it. And I, you know, I've been presenting now for many, many years and I had the operation. It was a success. I live with my tumor now. I'm fit and healthy. I'm like 80 or 53 year old woman, but I was going back to work. And my big question to me was, can I still do it? Am I going to remember my lines? You know, has that part of my brain been affected? What did I do? I went back to my learning because we know I'm a slot. I practiced every day. I used to set myself little examples and try and learn. And I gave myself the best possible opportunity. Everything said, so when I stood in front of that camera for the first time after being off and I had my scripts, I'd learned them off by heart and I delivered. But I put the work in beforehand to give me that confidence. I can't do things like that. I'm one of those people that has to work at it. That's the truth, but it works for me. So to wrap up, I just put down a little list of things that really help me when I need confidence. And we all need confidence, especially now in this new world. We might have confidence today, it might go tomorrow. But when you're putting yourself forward, be it for a presentation, for a TV show, and you know, being a presenter, it's pretty ruthless, or it might be helping people in your family unit get that confidence to go for the interview. Think about presentation. Think about how you look. Think about the homework that you've put into whatever situation you're going into. Do your homework. Smile. I'm a smiler. I like smiling. A lot of people don't. They're as grim as hell. If people are grim, you smile at them. Keep smiling, I tell you, they smile back, but it breaks down that barrier because remember, you only get first chance to win it or one chance to make a good impression, and that is so true. Firm handshake. These are basic things, really basic. But you know, when we're allowed, firm handshake. We're not allowed to at the moment. So again, we're back to the eyes and the smile. You've got to connect with people. You give them confidence. They don't look at you and think she's not confident. They have no idea what's going on inside. If you're not confident, act a little bit. I'll tell you, it works wonders. And um, be prepared, reframe it's that lovely term. If you're not confident, Go to the loos, give yourself my Radio 2 pep talk. We can do this. It's going to take 10 minutes. I can do it. I can do it because the negative vibes are very loud. Make sure your positive vibes are even louder. Know what you're good at. Maximize that. Really, really know what you're good at. and Keep that in the back of your mind. Don't sweat the small stuff. If you screw up, it doesn't matter. Most people haven't even noticed. I always say it on Radio 2, my producer in my ear says, don't tell them you got that wrong or they don't know. But if you do get it wrong, it doesn't matter. Don't sweat the small stuff. Enjoy it. Know what you're good at. And finally, I'm going to leave you with this thought. Be kind to yourself. Be kind and that confidence will grow. Thank you very much indeed. Well done, Nikki. I'm nodding away like a nodding dog there. <laughs> all smiling away and nodding away. No, thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable. I think all of you, thank you for being honest, for being vulnerable, you know, giving us insights into, you know, what's often behind that facade of confidence. Um, but I think, you know, there's some really invaluable advice and tips there from all of the speakers. So I hope you all found listening in, found that really, really helpful. So stay with us because we're going to go into some